Today we are with the professor of uh, Bar-Ilan University, Aaron Meyer. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Aaron uh, Meyer is a award renowned archaeologist. He has been excavating Tel El Safi, ancient city of God, for 25 years. Uh, welcome to our show. It's a big pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Recently, we had been talking to Professor Eric Klein from uh, Washington University about the collapse of the Bronze Age. This is the time, actually, when the first uh, Philistines appear in the land of uh, Khan, Canaan, or land of Israel, how we call it later. Who actually were those people, according to your archaeological research, and uh, why they came, and uh, what is their origin? Okay, um, that's a great question. Um, we could spend um, a year and a half talking about it, but we'll try to uh, synthesize this. Um, well, um, in the 13th century, we see a, um, a slow and developing proce a process of which the, um, the world order of the late Bronze Age uh, starts to come apart. Um, and it uh, doesn't begin at the end of the, um, of the 13th century, you know, around 1200, but um, uh, several decades before it. And we have from various sources indications that uh, various issues were beginning to uh, be put into play that caused the eventual um, collapse of this um, world order. And this includes uh, changes in climate, um, appearance of new uh, cultural groups, um, uh, perhaps um, earthquakes are involved with this, um, invasions of people, etc. And what this brings about is that for a period of about 150 years or so, from about 1250 to about 1100, we see that the, um, the picture that we had during the late Bronze Age uh, changes. And I like to say that uh, since um, archaeologists are like time travelers, and if we would go into our time machine and go to um, 1300, look around, and then get out and, and go to 1200 and then to 1100, we would see uh, a drastic change, but it's not an overnight change. It's a very long, drawn-out change. And one of these aspects, and one of the causes, but also one of the results, is the appearance of all kinds of new cultural groups. Um, among them, uh, what's known as the so-called uh, Sea Peoples, uh, peoples who um, apparently come from the central and perhaps even the western Mediterranean, and some of them arrive in the area of uh, the eastern Mediterranean coastal uh, uh, coast, well, the area of Israel, Lebanon, and Syria. Um, and among them, we have the Philistines. Now, who are the Philistines? This is one of the biggest questions in current research of the early Iron Age. Um, we can differentiate between the traditional interpretations and new directions um, that have developed recently. And I think uh, part of the these ideas uh, are coming out from the excavations that we've been conducting at Tel Safi for the last 25 years. Um, in the past, it was assumed that um, the Sea Peoples in general and the Philistines in particular were basically uh, groups of people who came from Greece, uh, maybe Sardinia, maybe Sicily, maybe um, East, uh, Western Anatolia. And during the period of the collapse of the uh, late Bronze Age and the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 12th century BCE, they migrated eastwards towards the, um, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And supposedly, according to the, 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 the uh, let's say the explanation that I was taught as a student, um, the Egyptian king, Ramses III, uh, in the beginning of the, of the 12th century, tells us that in, in his uh, reliefs at Medina Tabu, the temple of Medina Tabu, that he fought a group of people, including the Philistines and the Dananu and the, and the, and the Jeker and a couple of other groups of people. And supposedly, subsequently, the Philistines settled in the southern coastal plain, the, um, the Jeker uh, settled in the Carmel coast, the, maybe the Chardonnay, farther to the north. Um, as someone once said, it, it was sort of like a, uh, a D-Day-like invasion with different beaches, and each one landed on a different beach. Um, and this was very much the, uh, the understanding that the Philistines, like other Sea Peoples, were a group that invaded Canaan 
in the very early Iron Age and settled and brought with them a new foreign non-Canaanite culture. Could we refer to the Philistines as a one group of people? Well, um, we have a me Ramses the 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 third mentions um, a group called the Perishit. And since the Egyptians at that time, in the Egyptian language, there was no um, L, it's assumed that it means uh, it was a way of writing uh, Peleshet. And it was thought that it was a group of people that came from somewhere that might, that might be the original name. Nowadays, our interpretation is very, very different. Um, and I'll start from a little, going a little back, because when we look at the cities of Canaan in the southern coastal plain, um, that existed during the Late Bronze Age, many of them at the very end of the Late Bronze Age were not destroyed. We don't see massive destruction layers at Ashdod, at Gat, at, uh, at Ekron, um, which indicate a, uh, a massive destruction of a Canaanite city and then a new, completely fresh culture um, being settled on the site um, supposedly representing the, 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 the Philistines. Rather, we see that in many places the uh, destruction, if at all, is very minimal and there's no, there's, there's no replacement of a culture. And when we see this new culture, this no, new Philistine culture, it's not a culture which represents any other region specifically. That means we can't say that the Philistines were people who came from the Mycenaean culture, or from some Western Anatolian culture, or from Crete, or from Cyprus, because the material culture of the early Philistines is a mixed culture, what we call an entangled culture, because some of their aspects are Mycenaean, some are Cretan, some are Cypriot, some are even Egyptian, or Western Anatolian, or even from, uh, from farther away. And more so, when we look very closely at the uh, Philistine material culture, one of the things that we see that there is no um, destructions, that it's not a um, migrating groups that came to the southern coastal plain and destroyed the Canaanite cities and replaced the culture and brought with them a new non-local uh, non -local culture, but rather we see that from the very early uh, stages of the Iron Age, when the Philistine culture appears, it's comprised of people of various origins. It's not only Mycenaean or Cretan, or Cypriot, or Western Anatolian, but rather there are aspects in the early Philistine culture that are Mycenaean, Cypriot, uh, Cretan, Western Anatolian, Egyptian, and even from farther afield. And more importantly, there's evidence of Canaanites uh, within the culture. That means that the Philistine culture is a mixed culture comprised of various groups who came together, coalesced, and became entangled to form this unique uh, culture that we call the Philistines. And when we're um, talking about who they could be, so it's probably a very mix, not only of origins, but types of cultures. And for example, we've been arguing recently that perhaps one of the components that the Philistines uh, were comprised of were pirates, because if we're talking about the end of the Late Bronze Age, the beginning of the Iron Age, the time of a collapse of the political economic systems within the um, Eastern Mediterranean, one of the typical things that happens when political systems become weak is that marginal groups um, start um, um, piracy and become bandits and things like that. And so it could very well be that among the Philistines, you also had a uh, uh, a substantial component of, of pirates, not, the on, not that they were only pirates, but that was also among them. So when you look at who the Philistines are, instead of this image of people who got on the boats in Greece, came over to this area, landed, captured the Canaanite cities, and then started afresh with a foreign culture, they're starting from the very beginning with a, a mixed culture, which then uh, develops and changes with time but still retains its uniqueness because it's comprised of such a, um, a broad range of different influences coming together. If I'm going to the Egyptian sources, and uh, they're describing the fight with uh, Philistines, and uh, they expelled them, and they, in fact, settled them in uh, Canaan. 
But if I'm going to the Bible, I will find the story of uh, the first king of uh, Israel, Saul, who is actually going for an epic uh, battle with the Philistines, where he finds his death. And that happens at the Mount Gilboa, mm -hmm. which is located uh, at the north. Not the place I would uh, naturally expect to find the Philip Philistines. Mm -hmm. So how could, could that be? In the, is that the same uh, Philistines described by the Egyptian sources? Well, okay. First of all, let's talk about these two sources. The, um, the Ramses III description, the depiction of the battle with the Sea Peoples and the Philistines, that's an ideologically um, backed uh, de depiction. So even if there is a, a kernel of, of historicity in it, um, we have to take into account that what you're, you're seeing there is the version that the Egyptian king wanted to portray. So, so it's, not, it's not necessarily what happened. It's what the Egyptian king, Ramses III, wanted us, the, the viewers, to think that happened. The same thing goes for the biblical text. The biblical text, uh, uh, probably most of what's written about the Philistines is written down much later than the actual time. And it's again, even if it does to a certain extent depict actual events, it's actual events, which some of were remembered, and all of them are through the filter of the, of the writers and editors of the biblical text who have an ideological message or messages to portray. So that's, that's what we start with that. So you can't just say that it's, it's one historical um, uh, reality as opposed to another historical reality. It's, it's two ideological realities. Now, um, when you look at the uh, Egyptians, so they do describe... Um, a battle against the Philistines and other, and other so-called sea peoples, which, by the way, is a modern term. It's not an ancient term, sea peoples. And so there probably was some kernel of, of truth in this and probably did fight these various groups. But on the other hand, um, uh, from the archaeological evidence, um, we don't have any uh, clear evidence of this specific battle. So um, it could very well be that the process of the settlement of the, of the culture that we call the Philistines was a long, drawn-out process. I think it already started in the, in the late 13th century before um, the, the depiction of the battle uh, of, uh, of, of Ramses III on, in Medina Tabu. Uh, and uh, this drawn-out um, uh, process eventually brought about the appearance of these various uh, Philistine cities. Now, on the other hand, when you go to the biblical text, most of the biblical text which deals with the Philistines does place the Philistines in the coastal plain or in the Shvela, the Judean foothills. There are some things where they're placed elsewhere, such as the Battle of Saul in the Gilboa Mountain, but most do place it. But on the other hand, a lot of what relates to who the Philistines are in the early Iron Age, the Bible doesn't know about. The Bible is very lacking in information, about the early Philistines. What the Bible knows more about is the Philistines in later phases of the Iron Age. So I think in both cases, we're dealing with sources which have partial information, which are attempting to give us a, uh, a forced ideological view. And I don't think the, the, the lack of information makes this a, um, a contrast in, in, uh, in you know, a story. You got your fame by excavating the city of Gath. And uh, in fact, City of God is uh, well known for the readers of the Bible because it's mentioned in the Bible. But the question is uh, whether it's the Bible is trying to portray the real uh, City of God, its importance, its uh, size. Can you tell us about the historical God City which you see through the archaeology? Okay. Um, well, first of all, um, God to the Philistine up until our excavations was really only known from the biblical text, and it, actually in the biblical text, um, Gat is mentioned more often than any other of the of the Philistine cities. So, so there is a feeling of the importance of Gat, and it and it and it uh, it's in the stories of David. It's a story of uh, Goliath, of Achish, and other other um, um, events in the Bible. Um, one of the problems with the excavation of Gat is that for many many years the identification of Philistine God was not clear. And there are many, many places which were suggested. The most famous is Tel Arani, near, near Kiryat Gat, which was thought to be 
Gath of the Philistines, subsequent to excavations, it's clear that it's not. And um, by the time I started the project in 1997, it was clear that um, this is where Philistine Gath is, but I had to prove it. And um, from the excavations, uh, from the very beginning, but throughout the 25 years, it's become clear that the site of Gath during the Iron Age was one of the largest, if not the largest site in Canaan, and for sure in Philistia, uh, uh, during the Iron Age. And if up until then, we knew that the site was a Philistine city, um, our excavations have enabled us to look at this city in a very different way. First of all, um, it was settled from the very beginning of the Iron Age, and from around 1200, perhaps even a little before, we have evidence of the beginning of the Philistine culture. But surprisingly, from at least the 11th century onwards, that means the Iron 1B, and perhaps even a little uh, beforehand, Gat develops into this enormous uh, city of 45 to 50 hectares, that's 450 to 500 dunam, which includes both the, um, the upper tell, what we call the upper city, and a very large lower city below the, to the north of the upper tell, and it turns it into, um, for all intents and purposes, the largest city in, in, uh, in Canaan, in the, in the land of Israel, um, until its destruction by Hazael in 830 BCE. So first of all, the very fact of its size was, was, a, was a big surprise. We weren't aware um, in the archaeological research of what this, uh, what this city is. The other thing is, um, the rich remains that we, we have from the site, and in particular the rich remains from the destruction of the site, in 830 BCE, in the, in the Iron 2A, tells us a story that this uh, city was the main city of the Philistines um, at this time. And it apparently was the strongest um, city-state in the region. It apparently um, was very, very important, had a very, very important role in trade. Um, among other things, uh, copper coming from the Arava, perhaps um, other um, exotic materials coming from farther away. We have evidence that Greek pottery was traded um, with God in an early stage. And of, the, of all the sites of the Iron 2A in Canaan, um, Rehov in the Beit Sha'an Valley, and um, Gat in the, in the Shvela have more alphabetic inscriptions than in any other site. That means sites like Jerusalem or Megiddo or, or Gezer or wherever uh, have almost no, no inscriptions from this period. Rehov and Gat have more than all of them. And perhaps this is a hint to the regional roles of these two sites during the uh, late Iron I and early Iron II A. And this is very interesting because Rehov is not even mentioned in the Bible. Gat is mentioned in the Bible, but it's um, what the Bible knows about it is not that uh, extensive. And so we seem to have two sites which were had uh, much importance in early stages of the Iron Age. And perhaps the memory that the Bible has of these sites is somewhat uh, of one is completely forgotten, and the other of God, even though it appears, it doesn't fully, the Bible doesn't fully explicate what the role of this city was. And, and a beautiful example is when you go to the description in the biblical text in 2 Kings 12, 18, of the destruction of the city by Hazael. So this is mentioned in passing, in half a passage that... Hazael uh, went up to Gat and destroyed the, the city. And, and then he goes on to Jerusalem and there's a whole story. And, and this event is an enormously important geopolitical event that occurs in the mid uh, ninth century. It changes the whole geopolitical structure of the, of, the, of the land of Israel at the time. And it's mentioned in passing. Why is it mentioned in passing? Because the ideological uh, story that the biblical writer is interested in telling, uh, this event is only marginal. Could you describe the population of uh, Gad, uh, the inhabitants, and uh, if you could give a rough estimate, how many of them were there? Okay, well, um, first of all, 
Rough estimates are just that, rough estimates. I mean, you know, people who try to tell you how many people lived in a certain city, it's always a very, very thing. I would say it's probably somewhere between five and 10,000 people, which is not large in uh, modern uh, terms, but for the uh, ancient world and, the, and particularly the ancient land of Israel, um, it probably was a very large and substantial city. Uh, and we know this also from um, the size of the fortifications, the size of the city in itself, the, the various buildings that we have. There's a, a very impressive remains on the site. Now, who were the people? I think the people who lived in Gat during the Iron Age were a combination of the foreign and local peoples who comprised the Philistines um, from the very early Iron Age. And in addition to that, there was an ongoing interaction with the, um, with the other populations that lived in the region. We sometimes have this image that um, it's very easy to define and differentiate between the various so-called identity groups. I prefer identity groups than ethnic groups uh, that existed in the period and that they were Philistines and they were Canaanites and they were Israelites and Judites, but life was much more messy and much more gray. And I think there was a lot of um, interplay uh, between the groups. And for example, a very good example is the Samson narratives. Samson um, is an Israelite or a Judite uh, 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 who uh, kills Philistines and is in the end killed by Philistines, but he also marries a couple of Philistines and goes back and forth with Philistines and, and participates in, in events with the Philistines. So it's a, it's a very enmeshed culture. And we have evidence of this as well both at Gat, we have things coming from the Judite area, and in Judah, we have evidence of things coming from the, um, from the Philistine uh, region. So um, these people are connected. So there's a, an ongoing, um, you know, enmeshment. And I think to a certain extent, uh, although it's always dangerous to do this, if you compare um, modern-day Israelis to modern-day Palestinians, it's very much uh, similar because we're officially we're enemies, but on the other hand, we uh, we work together. We um, we have the same uh, food, the same uh, dress, uh, same jokes, etc. So it's a very enmeshed situation as in the past. Now, um, if I can add that we we don't have many names of the people of of God, um, neither from the biblical text or from the. Uh, archaeological remains. And the two most famous um, uh, Gittites in the Bible, of course, Achish, Achish, and Goliath, um, from our finds from the inscriptions that we have at Gant, we have, an, we have a shirt which has on it two names, which are something like Walat and Alwat. And these two names are not exactly Goliath, but they are apparently, from a linguistic point of view, come from the same family of languages that the name Goliath comes from. So that hints to us that in a, that part of the, uh, the population that lived at Gat in the Iron Age also had Indo-European roots, just as um, it's hinted from the name uh, Goliath and from the name uh, Akish. Uh, what could you teach us about the Philistines according to the material remainings, um, what they believed in? Um, they cult, their language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, let's start with language. Language is one of the most fascinating aspects when we study the Philistines. And again, if we go back to the um, earlier interpretations of the Philistines, since it was thought that they were a group of people that came from um, from Greece, so it was expected that they they spoke a language more or less like ancient uh, Mycenaean Greek, and they that they supposedly wrote using writing systems similar to the writing systems that we know in, in, in Mycenaean Greece, such as Linear B or Cipromenon. Um, with time, uh, as we've been excavating in Philistia for 150 years about, um, we haven't found any clear-cut evidence that the Philistines in the early Iron Age um, used a, a non-local, let's say an Aegean uh, writing system. Um, so um, that's one thing. The second thing is, when we look at the biblical text, there is various hints in names 
and words that are used in relationship to the Philistines, and it's uh, Achish and Goliath and Seren and a couple of other terms, that the within the uh, Philistine culture, there were people who were using Indo-European non-Semitic terms and names. This, we see that in the, uh, in the archaeological remains, we have, as I said, those two uh, names, sort of like uh, Goliath, Alwat and Walat. There may be a mention of the term uh, Seren, um, but it appears that the Philistines did not speak a uh, Mycenaean Greek, if at all. And if we go to our current understanding of who the Philistines, they're, they're a mixed group. They probably um, comprised what we would call a a complex language community. That means groups of a group of people who who came from various language backgrounds, and when they came together, they probably formed some sort of language that combined elements from various uh, origins. This would be what might be called a Creole or a Pidgin or something of the sort, and that's what they spoke. So they didn't speak Greek, they didn't speak Canaanite, but they probably spoke something. Uh, somewhere in the middle. Now, as far as writing, um, modern people very often assume that if you speak, you also write. And that's not necessarily the case in, for sure in antiquity and even till today. And writing in the Aegean was always connected to um, palace uh, administration. And once the palaces of the late Bronze Age Aegean collapsed, there was no reason to have writing anymore. So if the Philistines, even some of them did come from the Aegean area, they, uh, and even if they came with some, uh, with some scribes, very soon afterwards, there was no reason for them to write. And that's why when we do see writing in Philistia, it's two centuries later in the, um, let's say in the late 11th, early 10th century BCE, and by then, they're writing using an alphabetic script similar to the alphabetic scripts, Hebrew, Phoenician, uh, Proto-Canaanite, um, the archaic uh, versions that we see in other cultures of, the, uh, of the, the Southern Levant as well. And with the regard to the cult practices, what okay. you say? So now, again, cult is, a, is, a, is always a fascinating topic. Uh, we know a little about cult from the, from the uh, Bible. And for example, we know... Um, according to the Bible, their main god, deity, was Dagon. When we start looking at the archaeological evidence, things are a little more fuzzy. And for example, from what we can see, it would appear that the main deity in Philistia is actually a, a goddess. Uh, it, again, it might be an Aegean-type goddess, but it's, we don't see, see, seem to have evidence that the main god is, is male, but rather female. Uh, and we have... Um, both at Gat and its other uh, Philistine sites, evidence of temples and, um, and cultic corners and cultic paraphernalia, which tell us very nicely um, that there's uh, a lot of mixture in, in Philistine cult. And, it, it, and it's a great example of this entanglement that we talk about uh, among the Philistines, that on the one hand, you have Canaanite elements. On the other hand, you have... Aegean elements. On the other hand, you have Cypriot elements and Egyptian, and they're all mixed together. And we even have, we, for example, at Agat, we have a, a, a large um, stone altar, which most of it looks like a typical four-horned altar that we know so well in the Iron Age, except that it has two altars. And two-horned altars are known from Cyprus and from the Aegean. So even this very object is an entanglement of different uh, cultural traditions. According to the biblical text, uh, the first Israelites uh, met with the Philistines during the process of the nation formation. And uh, we see at some times uh, they were friends and even King David was serving in the, the King uh, mm -hmm. Achish, King of God. And of course we know the uh, fierce wars between Israel and uh, Philistines. Uh, how could you describe these relations? Well, I think um, the relationship was multidimensional. I think at times they were enemies, at times they were friends, at times they interacted, at times, you know, they it moved back and forth. And I think um, there, I don't think there were, ever was a period in which there was a, a wall 
and we're on this side, you're on this side, don't talk to me, don't have anything to do with me. Even when they're, um, when they're fighting, uh, supposedly, there's an ongoing interaction. That's one thing. And the other thing is the concept that this boundary was a static boundary is also something that I believe is mistaken. It's a, a very fluid and very moving and very um, non-concrete um, character and, and that people moved from side to side, people changed sides, and uh, you can you, a site like um, like Timna Tel Batash during the Iron Age, part of the time it probably was affiliated more with the Philistines, and part of the time it was affiliated more with the with the Jude, Judai Kingdom. And I think this was something very very common. And um, boundary zones such as the uh, such as the Shvela, the Judean um, um, foothills, is a classic place in which you have this um, intermeshment. So what eventually happened to the Philistines? When and why they disappeared? Okay, so um, uh, at 830, Hazel destroyed Gat. The four other cities, um, uh, Ekron, uh, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gaza, continued to exist to the end of the Iron Age. And uh, in 604 BCE, the Philistine cities revolted against uh, the Babylonian uh, Empire. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the same king who would um, 15 years later destroy uh, Jerusalem, uh, campaigned to the, uh, to the Philistine cities, destroyed them completely, and it killed or exiled all the inhabitants. And um, after the Iron Age and the early Philistine, in the early uh, Persian period, um, we have very little evidence of uh, population from uh, Philistia. And when we do start seeing um, population in Philistia, they seem to be, as far as the material culture is concerned, very Phoenician in character. So the feeling is, and most scholars would agree, that most of the Philistines were killed and those that were left, for the most part, were exiled to, um, to Babylon, to Mesopotamia. And there in Mesopotamia, for a century or so, we have evidence of people who regarded themselves as a person of Ashkelon, a person of Gaza, or something like that. But then they were uh, assimilated, and they basically, as a people, disappeared. Now, why is the name um, uh, Philistine or Philistia still retained in the name of the land Palestine? The reason that most people uh, accept is that um, the Greeks who came to this region already during the Iron Age, uh, whether as traders or mercenaries, um, in the late Iron Age saw the people um, in, in the southern coastal plain, and that region was called, either by the Philistines or by the Greeks, something like Philistia. And even after the region was depopulated by, uh, of, Phil of Philistines, the Greeks still called that specific region uh, Palestine or Philistia, and eventually, particularly after the um, the the revolt by um, Bar Kokhba in 135, the Romans changed the name of the land from Judea to Philistia or Palestina, and um, so it's just like you go to uh, Manhattan or you go to Cincinnati, and you're not going to find any people from the Manhattan tribe of North American. Uh, Indians or uh, in Cincinnati, but you but the, the names are retained, and I think that's what you have. So you don't have, um, I would say, direct genetic continuity between the the former uh, population of Philistia. They, for the most part, were probably uh, destroyed or exiled, but you do have continuity in the uh, in the um, the toponyms and the general region and what was called. One of the things to distinguish between the uh, Israelites and the others is the, actually what they ate at the time. Mm -hmm. So the Philistines, what was their diet and uh, what they used mm -hmm. to eat? Okay, so we often assume that, you know, the famous French um, uh, saying that uh, tell me what you, you know, tell you who you are. Um, so um, for many years it was assumed that um, it's very easy to differentiate between Philistines and Israelites um, if you're talking about um, uh, food, and in particular that supposedly the Philistines 
ate pig and, and dog, and the Israelites and Judites didn't. Uh, unfortunately, like most things in life, it's more complicated than that. Uh, and, and we now know that, in fact, the Philistines did eat pig and dog, but um, at different sites in Philistia, there's a different amount of consumption of pig and, and, and dog meat. And on the other hand, when we go to the Israelites and the Judites, so it turns out that at many sites in Israel, they did eat pig. And when we go to Judah, at most sites they don't. But for example, just recently in Jerusalem, in a ninth century context, and it's been suggested that uh, this might be, in an eighth century context, it must be suggested this is perhaps in the destruction caused by the earthquake in the time of Uziyao, in the, in the mid eighth century BCE, they found a little piglet in one of the houses. So which means that even if most of the Judites um, didn't eat pigs, some did. So that may, means that the, um, the identification of groups based on diet only on yes or no pig is, is more complex than we thought. That said, I think there is more Philistines eating pig than you do have Judites. And perhaps the, the lack of eating pig among the Judites at the time might be the very, very beginning of the dietary customs, which later developed into what we now know as kashrut, the, the Jewish dietary customs. But I think at this time, it was not as clear cut and you eat pig, you're Philistine, you don't eat pig, you're not a Philistine. That's one thing. The other thing is we have other aspects that we can see of changes. And for example, when we look at the diet that the Philistines have from the point of view of plants, we can also say that with the appearance of the Philistine culture, there are new types of plants that appear in the region. There are new types of plants that are being used for the time, from the first time from the region. There are changes in agricultural practices and other things. Another way we can see the difference between the Philistines and others is also apparently hinted to in the Bible, um, a, uh, a, a preference of drinking uh, alcoholic uh, beverages, and perhaps the biblical tradition about Samson being a uh, a Nazarite, someone who doesn't drink um, wine, might might be some hint to this difference between the, the cultures. And one of the nice things is we have nice evidence from Philistia and in particular from God for um, what they drank. And um, we conducted a very interesting um, um, research project, which is still ongoing, in which we uh, found at Gat several vessels um, which traditionally we've called them beer jugs. That means it's a, a closed jug. This should have a, uh, a, a, uh, a neck here. Uh, and then it has a spout which has uh, a strainer inside the sprout. And this was, uh, has very often been understood as a, as a beer jug in which they had beer inside. And when you poured your beer into the cup or bowl that you were going to drink it from, this strained the, um, the sediment from within. They, there's all kinds of uh, gook that comes with the... Uh, thing. But this was never proven. And <clears throat> a few years ago, we took a couple of these vessels. And um, by taking samples from within the vessels... Um, a team of microbiologists from the Hebrew University who were collaborating with us managed to um, identify and isolate yeast cells from within these vessels, and which means that the yeast cells that had existed in these vessels 3,000 years ago um, managed to find um, microenvironments within the ceramic matrix and continue to exist and reproduce for, for millennia, even though there was minimal um, um, food. And these yeast cells were identical to yeast cells used till today in the production of, of beer and, and wine and, and, um, and, and in fact bread. And what we managed to do is to isolate them, grow them, we identified them uh, for, as far as DNA, and then we used these yeast cells to make beer. And we made beer which came out very, very tasty. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're even thinking of uh, perhaps commercializing it and selling uh, Philistine beer. Who wouldn't want to drink uh, uh, Goliath beer? Uh, and um, it was a fantastic example of, you know, we always talk about 
you know, feeling the past, and here we were tasting the past. And this is something very special. Now, another object which I um, mentioned before is this very, um, uh, very unusual uh, monolithic stone um, altar with two horns. This is a, uh, a 3D print-up on a smaller scale of the object. We did a very, very accurate um, 3D model of the original object, which, by the way, is in the Philistine Museum in Ashdod, highly uh, recommended to go visit there. Um, and this gives us an idea of the, of the size and the shape of the original object. And you can see that this uh, altar was uh, decorated in the front with this um, cornish here, and on the side, it had two well-made uh, horns in the front, but the back of the, uh, of the uh, altar and its uh, back sides are unfinished. And, and this, is a, this is how the stone looked like it when it came out from the quarry. And they only made these two uh, horns. These two horns were never uh, produced. So the question is, did they perhaps um, make this and then they realized they forgot to make two horns and this was a second hand? Did they make two horns out of another material? Or is this a combination of a tradition of an altar with decoration four horns, but because it's bringing in an Aegean or Cypriot tradition of only two horns, so they made the object partly um, Levantine, partly Aegean in character, and this is a very nice, in, in my opinion, example of the entangled culture uh, uh, of the Philistines. Professor uh, Aaron Meyer, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad you, uh, you came to, uh, to interview me. Thank you.